Have you ever heard of the X Factor? Some of y'all, when you heard that, you probably thought of this particular show. Some of y'all remember this show? This was the televised music competition franchise that was created by this man, Simon Cowell. But before the show came into existence, the saying, the X Factor, was already a part of our societal lingo, especially in the realm of sports and the arts. When somebody says that person has the X Factor. To say someone has the X Factor, when we use that in our societal kind of terminology, what we're saying is that an individual has a noteworthy or special or extraordinary quality or talent about themselves that makes themselves stand out from the crowd and from the competition. You know, that quarterback has the X factor. That athlete has the X factor. That singer has the X factor. That person has that X factor. There is, however, another definition of the X factor that I need you to see. The X factor can also refer to a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on an outcome. I want you to read that with me again. Read it silently as I read out loud. A variable, the X factor, is a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on an outcome. This whole series is about motivating and mobilizing us to engage spiritually lost people. We have learned so far that God has sent us, you and me, Christians, in the world as ambassadors for Christ to share his PSA, his public salvation announcement with others. So... If we think about the outcome being this, the outcome being sharing the gospel of Jesus with spiritually lost people, a.k.a. non-Christians, the question becomes then, what is the variable that has the most significant impact on us being able to do that? Are y'all tracking with this? Remember I gave you that definition, a variable, the X factor is a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on an outcome. If the outcome is us sharing the gospel of Jesus with spiritually lost people, what's the variable that has the most impact on that outcome? The variable it has the most impact on us being able to tell people about the good news of Jesus is what I'm calling not the X factor, the P factor. What is the P factor? Y'all ready for this? It's deep, Alejandro. It's deep. Y'all hold on to your spiritual seatbelts, Kevin. Sharon, watch it. Here it is. The P stands for prayer. <laughs> Seriously, pastor? You mean to tell me I woke up this morning, got dressed, drove all the way here, made it to church just in time, just in time to hear you preach, only to sit here and have you tell me something as basic as that? First of all, don't, don't, don't take my first of all as me snapping, you know, it ain't, that, that's not the tone. First of all, if you simply come here from week to week just to hear me preach, as flattering as that sounds to me and feels to me, you are falling woefully short of all that God desires for you to do when we gather together as the church. Here's a commercial break. There's more I could say about that, but I'm going to wait until Sunday, February the 4th. Two Sundays from today, 
on Sunday, February 4th, I need you to be here so that we can hear from God's word about what he desires for each of us to do when we gather together as his church. That sermon will not be about why we need to gather. That sermon is going to be about what does God expect us to do when we gather here. That's, that's, that's two Sundays from, from the day. Not next Sunday because we're going to conclude the series next Sunday. And then Deja's going to preach the following Sunday. But that, oh, that first Sunday, Kevin, that first Sunday, y'all need to be here because we need to hear what God has to say about what does it mean, what does he want us to do when we gather together. And it's not just 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 a sneak peek. It's not just to come and hear me preach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, as far as your point about prayer being basic, it is. Let me pose a situation to you. What if someone wanted to take a job in the industry you work in? but didn't have the required basic skill set or experience or certifications or academic credentials, or they don't want to go through any type of basic training and onboarding or pursue any type of professional development. Would you or your company or organization hire them? More than likely not. And if by chance that person did get hired, how do you think he or she would do in fulfilling their job duties? I think we both know the answer to those questions. They probably would not be hired. And if they were hired, things would not go well for that person because we know that there are fundamentals to your job that a person needs to embrace if they are going to be competent in their work. The same is true when it comes to us sharing the gospel of Jesus with people who are far from God. If we want to be faithfully engaging the world, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors with the good news of Jesus, we must be committed to the basic spiritual discipline of prayer. Here, here's the thesis Here's the central idea. Here's the big truth of today's sermon. You ready? Here it is. Prayerful dependence on the Holy Spirit is an indispensable factor in sharing the gospel of Jesus with others. Prayerful dependence on the Holy Spirit is an indispensable factor in sharing the gospel of Jesus with others. I want you to go with me if you have your scripture Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts is in the New Testament. It is right after the book of John. Seriously, that didn't mean that it's a slight to anybody. Some people don't know where the books of the, of the Bible are, and that's okay. Acts, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Go to Acts. If you have a Bible app, it is so much easier to find books of the Bible. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, verse 8. According to verse 8, who gives us the power or ability to be Jesus' witnesses? Now, this is an open book exam with one question. This exam has one question. It is open book, so... If you ain't done it yet, open your Bible and look at the text. Verse 8, the answer is there. Anybody ever had open book exams at school? You ever, ever have people still fail an exam? An open book exam? <laughs> we got read, read slowly before you answer. Okay, I don't, I don't want you to answer out loud yet because I want to give people, other people, everyone an opportunity to find the answer. Look at verse 8. The question, the one Question on this open book exam is this. Who, not what, who gives us the power or ability to be Jesus' witnesses? Y'all ready to yell it out? Here, give me the answer. One, two, three. Who is it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. A plus. Amen. You pass. The Holy Spirit. Look at the text. It says, Jesus says, 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Do you see where the power to be Jesus's witness comes from? It comes from God, the Holy Spirit. It comes from him. Hear me, y'all. I hope this message is going to free some of us up and teach some of us. God is not expecting you to drum up the strength to be a witness for Jesus. He's not expecting you to look inside yourself, among yourself, inherent to who you are, who you are, your being. And look, he, and God's just got his arms folded and is saying, I told you to witness. I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on you to do it. No, God the Spirit is with us, in us, and he gives us the ability to share Jesus with other people. How does that happen? It happens, hear it, through us consciously and constantly relying on the Spirit through prayer. See, this is the reason why we, when we are faced with opportunities to share Christ, why we fail to do it is because in some sense and in some measure, in some ways, in certain circumstances, we're not consciously praying and saying, Spirit, help me. And we're not constantly praying that. So there are three prayer requests that we should regularly ask the Holy Spirit to fulfill in relationship to sharing the gospel of Jesus with others. Three prayer requests that we should regularly ask the Holy Spirit to fulfill in our lives in relationship to sharing the gospel of Jesus with others. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 4 in the New Testament. And I want you to put your eyes on verses 2 and 3 with me. You know, we have... We have some real nifty sayings in the church, and I, and I, and I mean that. That's not a dig. I, I mean, we, we come up with, with, some, with some nifty sayings, especially, especially when it comes to, like, yearly themes. Right? We, don't, we don't do that here at Harvest, where we get a word for the year, and it rhymes with the year. You know what I'm saying? I want more in 2024. Uh, God, make me free in 2023. You know, what's one for 2022? Which one? We, what we do for 20? I don't know. It's one, okay. What do we do for 2022? <laughs> we have some. We do. We have some nifty sayings, man, in the church. Here's one. God will open doors that no man can shut. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean that's, that's true. And what we generally mean by open doors is that God will open a door of blessings, like a new job. I'll tell you, God's that type of God, man. Well, you, ain't, you ain't even got to be qualified for the job. If God wants you to have it, he'll open a door that no man can shut. Whoop, whoop, we go in. Hallelujah. A new house, new apartment. He'll open the door. Won't he do it? We, yes, sir. Yes, sir. New car. Lord knows I've been praying for one. Went through CarMax. Ooh, the Lord is good. A promotion, a raise. Marriage, a new venture, I felt something right there. When I said marriage, some of y'all was like, um, I, I don't mind him opening the door in reverse. Like, I, 
I want him to get me out of this thing. Uh, make me single again, Jesus. Make me single again. <laughs> Now, that's, no, don't trip, because that's a blessing for real for some people. Okay. Singleness ain't singleness is not a ball and chain. Singleness is a gift from the, from, from the Lord. And we exhort each other to pray and ask God to open those type of doors, do we not? You pray. Ask, ask the Lord to open that door. What you need, ask him. To, he, can, he can do it. Won't he do it? Yes, hey, yes, he will. Pray. I've seen him do it. I know I got some testifiers in the building. I know I ain't the only one. Won't he open, make your way out of no way? Won't he open a door that nobody can shut? And we like, yes, he will. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yes, he will. Hallelujah. Yes, he will. And praise God, he does. But you know, there's another door that we should be praying for. It's in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Paul says, at the same time, pray also for us, here it is, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. You, you want this first prayer request? Here's the first prayer request. The first prayer request is that we need to pray for the Spirit to give us opportunities open doors of opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with other people. See that? I know you process it, but, but you, see, you see what happens sometimes? We've, we've gotten so accustomed to praying to God about all other types of open doors, but yet have failed to talk to him and ask him to open doors of what his primary mission is for our lives. And God wants to change that. Some of us are there, but many of us are not. We, we, don't, we don't consciously and constantly pray for this. Because if you like me, I'm so wrapped up in my own life. I'll, be, I'll admit it. I got, I got to pray for my kids, William and Shanita. I got, we got to pray for this job. I do need more money because we got two girls who are growing up, and they eat you out of the house and a home as they're starting to grow up. I mean, I got a lot of stuff to pray about. And often, I mean, am I the only one? But sometimes what is last on the list and what is not on the list at all is praying for the Spirit to give us opportunity to share the gospel with people. So you thought you were going to come to church. This wasn't going to be relevant to your life. The Word of God is always relevant, brothers and sisters. We, we need to ask, like Paul asked the church at Colossae to pray for him and others, that God will open a door for the message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus to get out. This request is something that we should not only pray for ourselves, but for one another as well. Heavenly Father, through the work of God, the Holy Spirit, we ask that you open a door of opportunity for us to tell others about the good news of Jesus. Holy Spirit, open a door of opportunity for us to tell our, our parents about Jesus, for us to tell our siblings about Jesus, for us to tell our relatives about Jesus, for us to tell our own children about Jesus, to, uh, for us to tell our friend about Jesus, even a complete stranger about the gospel of Jesus. Do you, do you sense something, I, I, and I'm not getting mystical here, but I'm, I mean just discern something that when, when you and I start to really focus in on the mission of Jesus, do you sense the spiritual warfare that kicks in? You, you know it kicks in. I felt it in the room, just even as we, I'm preaching this, because um, things start happening like, well, that, that seems so boring. Well, that, that seems so, so basic. I, I got all of these needs and stuff over here. You mean to tell me that I got to start praying more about this? That, that's, that's spiritual warfare. Because here, here, here Jesus say, and what does it profit of, for a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul? And what happens is as Christians, what the enemy does is he wants us to get, get distracted with gaining the world. That we no longer have any concern about people whose souls are lost. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is not condemning us. This is to convict us, to shake us out of our spiritual stupor. I'm one of them. Lord, help me because I'm so engaged and I'm so involved in my own life and in my own bubble and all the stuff that I got going on. And I'm not saying any of that is bad, but Lord, it is bad when it is to the exclusion of the mission that you've called us to be on. Yes, God wants you to take your care, do your marriage thing or be single and take care of your kids and work and do all of that and make good money and whatever the case is and take care of you and be responsible and fiscally responsible and good stewardship and all that stuff over your business and all that. Yes. But if we miss the mission, we're going to have to answer for that when you and when I stand before our Lord. And I want to gently push us a little farther and deeper to not just pray for lost people, but pray for them by name. Why so specifically? Because I think when we pray for people by name, we become more keenly aware of opportunities the Holy Spirit may present to us to share the gospel with that individual. It's easy for us just to pray. I do that. I, at times, I, the Lord has to convict me of that, even here recently. Yes, you're praying generally about it, but why are you not praying more specifically? Yes. And one, it's a challenge to me because it's like, well, I can't pray specifically, Lord, because I don't know if I know any unbeliever's name. And the Lord is saying, yeah, that's an that, that's a area of growth. I need you to get to know Christ, non-Christians and get to know their names. And I was like, oh, yes, Lord Jesus. Yes. But it makes me more keenly aware. It'll make you more keenly aware when you start praying for Betty and Pablo and Tyrone. By name. And praying specifically, watch it. To give me, see, see, not just, not just, Lord, let somebody get the gospel to him. That's a good prayer, but it changes the game, Michael, when, when we start praying, Lord, you give me an opportunity to share the gospel with cousins such and such. With brother such and such, with aunt such and such, with friend such and such, with homegirl such and such, with this person that I know, at least by name. Uh, my wife and our daughters and I go to um, a particular restaurant quite frequently. Yesterday we stopped as we were uh, sitting there um, ordering our food. We, we go there. A, a, a lot. I don't even want to tell you how much the food is good. We go there a lot, and as we're at the table, we we got the owner's name. One point, at one point, we got we got there so much. We went there so much, and we patronized him so much. We're like, you know what? We probably should get to know the. I mean, this is the woman who's running the shop, right? Shay, we got to, we should get to know her, and we asked her name. And she gave it to us, but there was always this young man that was in on the other side, he looked to be about maybe in his 20s. He was in the other side and he was working the drink, you know, the bar section, right? Don't, don't trip. Don't do that. I felt the, I felt the spirit of offense and ju judgment. I didn't say we were drinking. I just, okay. Come on. All right. So he was working at the bar. And just so we can clear it up, he was making bobo, Okay. Boba, you know, you know, the tea, you know, with the, with the ball, you know, the little, whatever those things are, right? It's, it's a Vietnamese spot. Okay. okay, it's a Vietnamese spot. We go there and we eat. We love the, this pho, pho, however you pronounce it. I mean, it's, I mean, listen, if you ain't had that pho, pho in your life, you, you, you missing out. Just, okay, so we go. It's real good. Um, we go, we sit, and we say, you know what? 
the, the guy comes over, and he actually, before he comes over, he actually waves at us. We wave at him. That's how much we go there. <laughs> they don't wave at nobody else, Mike. Not, I'm not nobody, but they know us. They say, hey, well, yeah. And we waved at him, and he came over. We said, you know what? Let's, let's stop. They said, man, you know, we never have asked you your name. What's your name? He told us our name, his name. Gave us his name. I said, this is, uh, this is my name, this is my wife, this is our daughters, these are our daughters' names. And then he gave us his name, and he gave us his daughters' names, his kids' names, because we see him running around the restaurant. And you know, yesterday the Lord just kind of was dealing with me as, as I was preparing this message. It was just like, Ed, I want you to start praying for him. I want you to start praying for an opportunity specifically for you to share the gospel with him. And I said, we're going to commit to do that as a family. We're going to pray for it. We have an opportunity that the Spirit will give us to share the gospel with this young man. I get it because here's what I started thinking. Well, what if it, what if it never happens, though? And the, I, the spirit kind of put on my mind, it's like, that's fine. But just because it may not happen through you doesn't mean it cannot happen at all through somebody else. Well, well, hold on, Jesus. Well, what, what if, though? What if I find out, we find out that the guy's already saved? You know, like, like, like what, if, what, if we, what if we share the gospel with him and he ends up being a believer? And he's like, yeah, I trust Jesus, you know, as my Lord and say, boom, boom, boom. And the Spirit was like, cool, that's no problem. Maybe the Lord wanted to use that opportunity to stoke the flames of evangelism in your heart. And maybe possibly in his heart as a fellow believer. And, you know, the, the, this, the scenario, I start posing more scenarios. What if? What if? What if? And David and I was driving up here to, to the church, and I was reading over, not, not reading literally over my manuscript. I was re reviewing my manuscript in my mind. And, and the Lord kind of gave me an illustration. He, he, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, a kid that was playing on the basketball team, and... As the game was going on, they were in the game, and this kid was running up and down the court. And all of a sudden, after a few months, you know, instances of running up and down the court, the coach saw his player standing over by the corner of the three-point line just with, it, with his hands down and kind of just sulking. They turned the ball over. The defense got it. They started running away, and this person just – Lollygagging down the court. Team scored. His team passes the ball in. He turns around and just starts walking back down the court. Timeout came. Coach play, called the players over. The coach looked at the player in his face and said, um, what's going on with you? Like, I, I don't like what I'm seeing. Like, this attitude and this whole snap, like, what's happening with you? The kid got the courage to speak up and was like, Coach, I'm, I'm mad and I'm frustrated. Because every time I run down the court, nobody passes me the ball. So I'm just sitting here, am I just supposed to keep running down the court? And nobody's, I'm, I'm wide open and the ball never comes to me. What's the point? The coach looked at, at that at his player and said, listen, I, I selected you to be on this team. I could have chosen anybody else. I gave you a jersey. You got a number. You on this roster. You got a position. I put you on this court. And you mad because you went up and down the court a couple of times and the ball didn't come to you. You seemed that you were out of the play. Nobody saw you. They didn't give you the ball. And he said, you know, that's, that's a part of the game of basketball is you still have to run the play. You still got to get in position and do what it is that you're supposed to do because any given moment, 
The ball can come to you and you need to be ready. And as a matter of fact, young player, before I bench you for this attitude that you have, because you're not going in in the second half, maybe I'll let you in, maybe, maybe in the fourth quarter. I'll, let me think about it. But I think this is a moment that I need to give some correction to you. If the ball don't come to you and it comes to another teammate and they score the ball, and maybe you don't ever get the ball until the, in the entire game, as long as your team is scoring points, that's a moment for you to celebrate and be grateful and to cheer on your team. How dare you get on this team and you fail to participate in the game? I put you on this team and you should be grateful enough to be on this team and be on the court just to play a small part. And if that means you just got to run up the ball, run the ball up or give an assist or the ball rarely comes to you and you never score a basket, as long as we're putting points on the board, you should be fine. Not to the point, I understand the frustration, but not to the point to where you want to sulk and not participate at all. If you're going to do that, then you might as well sit right here on this bench. Do you know we at times do the same thing when it comes to Jesus' mission? Jesus is saying, I'm the coach. I, I recruited you. I put you on the team. I gave you my jersey. I put you on the roster. I'm the one who has equipped you and put you on this mission field. And if you're on the mission field, I know there may be what is that come but don't let the what ifs don't don't what if yourself out of participation in the mission of Jesus what if I never what if he doesn't well what if he does I know that I'm not saying it doesn't affect us but it shouldn't affect us to the point to where we don't want to engage at all it's a privilege to be on Jesus' team and for him to have us on his mission field and whether the ball always comes to us or not, or whether the opportunity always comes to us or not, that shouldn't be the point. The point is, Lord, give me grace by your spirit to take every opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with somebody. And whether they respond to it favorably or not, I thank you that you put me on this mission for you. For you. God, here this family has brought that person. Do you have their name? You have their face if you don't know their name. He's brought that lost person, hear this, and you in close proximity to one another for a reason. They got hired at the same company as you for this reason. They are on the same, in the same department as you, or maybe even on the same team as you for this reason. They moved into the same apartment complex or in the same neighborhood as you. They transferred to the same school. They are in your class, maybe even sitting next to you. Maybe they reconnected with you over social media. It's time for you and I to start praying to God to open a door of opportunity for us to share Jesus with them. Well, I've already shared the gospel of Jesus with that particular person. And some of you would say, I've even shared it more than once. Praise God. Hear me? Then the prayer maybe needs to shift from asking the Holy Spirit to open the door to now open a heart. When I, you don't have to feel pressured and condemned and like, well, I shared it about it's my fifth time sharing Jesus with them and they, you know, well, praise the Lord. Maybe you don't need to share it anymore, at least presently. Now the prayer needs to be, Lord, they know, open their hearts now. Holy Spirit, open their hearts so they might receive and trust Jesus as Savior and Lord before they breathe their last breath. Here's the second prayer request. Y'all okay? Here's the second prayer request. Pray for the Spirit to give us boldness to share the gospel of Jesus with others. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Go back. Acts chapter 4. Acts 4. Some of you all will remember this situation. If you don't, I encourage you to read Acts chapter 4. Actually, Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4 in its entirety. Peter and John were going up, into the, going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. And there was this lame man, lame beggar at the, at the gate of beauty, called Beautiful at the temple. Some of you all remember this? And he was begging for him, begging alms from them. 
Like, give me some money. You know, give me a dollar. Give me a dollar. You know, that's, I work with our homeless friends, so, you know, I know how they be talking. Give me a dollar. You got some change, you know, give me some change. Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have any of that. Such as I have, I give it unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. This man gets up, he's healed, rises up, he stands up, walks on his own, and they, they go into the temple, and he's leaping and praising God, right? And then all of a sudden, there's these religious rulers, the scribes and Sadducees and all, all these religious elders and rulers. Some think that that was the Sanhedrin. That they see this, and they are mad at what has taken place. They, they, they pull Peter and John aside, and they basically tell him, hey, by what authority did you hear this man? Da, 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 da. They, they, they charge him up. They hem him up. And Peter and, Peter and John basically tell him, and they threaten him. And they say, you can no longer speak or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. Don't do that when you leave here. And this is where Peter says that, that famous phrase, you know, where he says, whether we should listen to God or man, you know, that's basically up to you, but we're going we gonna to obey God, right? Um, this is what happens in response to that in verse 29 and 30. After Peter and them are released, the church comes together <laughs> and starts to pray. In verse 24, you see it. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices to God and said, they, they're praying. Jump down to verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You know, there are a lot of things that seek to prevent or prohibit us from sharing the gospel of Jesus with others. If you've done this before, you've experienced it. If you've, if you've shared the gospel of Jesus, attempted to share the gospel of Jesus with others, here's some of the things that I know that you've experienced or you will experience. One is threats. People give verbal, some people give physical threats. If you don't shut up, like, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say, and I'm about to do something to you if you don't leave me alone. There's also personal rejection. When you start getting serious about sharing Christ with other people, people will socially ostracize you. In, in other words, they even, they even your family, non-believing family members will start to like relegate you to the side, will, will stop responding to your text message and calls, will, will ostracize you. They'll reject you. There's negative responses that you're going to get. Anybody been there? You sharing the gospel of Jesus and people just, they ignore you. Hey, hey, can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> just walk smooth off and don't engage you whatsoever. There are other people who you respond, who you give the gospel to and share the gospel of Jesus with them, and they will go, they'll, they'll be, they'll give you a cold or stern response. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to anything you got to say. Or, no, thank you. You ever be, be cold and kind at the same time? Yeah. No, no, thank you. And it's that you, they, they don't. They don't want you to continue trying to, to talk to them, trying to convince them. No. Some people will mock you. And some people will get angry. Then there's the stuff that happens internally. Like insecurity. Like, what do I say? Like, how do I navigate the conversation? What if I get confused by a question that they ask me? And then there's anxiety. Am I the only one? You feel the Holy Spirit prompting you to share the gospel, and it's like, ooh, woo, and it's, it's like shoulders get tense, breathing gets shallow and quick or whatever. You start hyperventilating. It's like, really, Holy Spirit? No, that wasn't you. That wasn't you. That wasn't you. Mm -mm. How about this one? Awkwardness. 
It's like you, you want me to, you want me to do what? That's, this is, that's awkward though. We need to take a page out of the early church's book and pray specifically about the issue that is seeking to keep us quiet. Did y'all hear the early church? Did you hear the early church when they prayed? Did you see that? In Acts 4, their prayer was, verse 29, and now, Lord, look upon their threats. They prayed specifically about what it is that was seeking to prevent them or prohibit them from speaking about Jesus. And you and I need to do that. Watch it, though. Read the Bible carefully. Note that the early church didn't ask God to remove the issue, but instead to give them boldness to speak the gospel of Jesus to people in spite of the issue. Did you see it in the text? They said, now, he said, now, Lord, look upon their threats. See, they just saying, look, Lord, just be aware that they threatening us. They didn't say, Lord, remove the threats. Stop them from talking to us so bad. Jesus, can you stop them from threatening us? They didn't say that. They just said, Lord, look upon their threats. Be aware of it. And you know what it is. But what they pray for is God give us boldness in spite of the threats. Y'all, the anxiety may never subside. The awkwardness may still be present. The insecurity may remain. The negative responses will continue occasionally happening. The personal rejection may continue to be a reality and the threats may come and go. But regardless of the issue, we need to pray for God to give us boldness to continue telling people about Jesus. Because this is what stops some of us. We want God to eliminate the issue. Take the issue out of the way, God, and I'll do it. And God says, no, you pray for the spirit to give you boldness to do it in spite of. In spite of. And according to verse 31, what was the response to their prayer for boldness? So y'all reading the Bible with me. Verse 31 says, and when they had prayed. Y'all see the P factor? When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Here it is. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The Holy Spirit filled them. And they continued to preach, to share the gospel, speak the gospel with boldness. There is no boldness without the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that filling happens through prayer. Can can I go on? Let me, I need to pause here because I need to teach a little bit. Will you know, Daydream, will you know, Kevin Ransom, will you know, Zandra, that the church didn't have to speak in tongues in in order to be filled with the Spirit? The church didn't have to pray in tongues in order to be filled with the Spirit. The Bible says they prayed, and they prayed in their native language. They prayed. And for us, it would be praying in English. And the Bible says in response to their natural born language of praying to God, they were filled with the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit. And let me go on here and do a little teaching on pneumatology while I'm here. Pneumatology is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Let me do this real quick. Put it, on the, put it on the screen for me. Let me do it real quick. Let me do it. Let me do it. There is a difference between the indwelling versus the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference. Biblically, first, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the one-time permanent arrival of the Holy Spirit into the life of of your, in your life and in mine, upon conversion. The moment you trust Jesus, the Bible says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He comes into your life one time, permanently. So, you don't need, uh, you don't need like this second baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because you already got him. The moment you trust in Jesus, 
You receive the Holy Spirit. Well, well, I can't, I can't stay here. Well, why does the Holy Spirit in Acts seem to come upon people like after they believe? Because it was the initiatory coming of the Spirit. He only he did it in special situations, in certain circumstances, because he wanted to show the Jewish Christians, for example, that the same spirit that they had in Christ was the same spirit that these Samaritans and these Gentiles over here had. They both believed the gospel and they both received the spirit, which is why, incidentally, why in those special cases, why some of them, not all of them, some of them spoke in tongues after that is because it's showing the Jewish Christians that the same spirit that y'all receive is the same spirit that these Gentiles receive through faith in Jesus Christ. It was no way trying to establish a norm to say that this is what should happen to all Christians at all times. It was a special occurrence. It was the first coming or the coming of the Holy Spirit. So he had to do some things to identify different subsets of people that Jewish people thought could not be a part of the people of God. Yeah. Teach, Pastor Josh. I'm trying. I'm trying to. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. There is no sense in which a Christian is a Christian and don't have the Holy Spirit. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. He is the one who convicts. He is the one who converts. He is the one who convinces. Okay, I got to get off of this. Listen, he is the one that does the work. And it happens in every believer's life. He comes into our lives one time permanently. Next. The infilling of the Spirit is the ongoing influence and empowerment of the Spirit in the life of a believer to achieve the purposes of God in Christian living and witness. This stuff is what happens continually. You don't get more of the Spirit. The Spirit just exerts more influence and more empowerment. He gives you more empowerment to do what it is that God is calling you to do. So the church prays and the Holy Spirit fills, empowers them to share the gospel boldly in spite of the issues that are coming against them. Same thing with you and with me. This is what he does. This is why we need to pray. Pray for him to fill us so that we might have the boldness to share Christ in spite of whatever things may be coming against us. Go back with me, last thing. Go back with me to Colossians chapter 4. Y'all all right? Colossians chapter 4. Do you know what one, of, what one of the most challenging aspects to any relationship is? Whether it be parenting, if you're a parent here with kids, you know this to be true. Whether you're married, if you're married, you, you know this to be true. Whether you have a friendship, you know this to be true. Or whether amongst your family or even work. One of the most challenging aspects to any relationship is communication. On, on one hand, on one hand, Jamel, there is comprehension. My wife and I were sitting, remember that restaurant I told y'all about? My wife and I were sitting at the restaurant yesterday. Um, and I decided to spark up a conversation about this border crisis that's going on. Trust me, we're not about to do the political thing. I don't, we're not about to do that. I don't do that over the pulpit. The, the pulpit is for the scriptures, not, not politics. But, but we were talking about this whole skirmish going on between Governor Abbott and President Biden, you know, concerning the seizure of Shelby Park by the Texas National Guard. Y'all, some of y'all know about this. If, if you don't, just look it up. Governor Abbott decided to send Texas National Guard to secure, you know, Shelby Park, and even the mayor of um, of the city, the local city there, is involved in this little thing. And and so there's a skirmish going back and forth, right? And talk, there's talks of suing and taking it to the Supreme Court and all this stuff. So I, as I sought to explain the situation to my wife, um, Mama Pew, um, my my wife looked up at me uh, from the table with confusion on her face. 
And it was obvious, um, Nicole, that my wife and I were struggling to communicate with each other at that point. And so I explained it again. I was like, is it Governor Abbott? And this is President Biden and then the border crisis and there's, there's this thing going on and he sent the text to the National Guard and then, but there's other, you know, agents and all this stuff that, you know, try, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then they like the gov you know, president saying you need to, re you know, re remove your officers, you know, Texas, Texas National Guard and that's not under your control, you, you, blah, blah, blah. And then I, I realized that, that the issue um, wasn't about comprehension. I thought to myself in a moment of, of humility by God's grace and his spirit. Husbands, y'all, you know, spouses, y'all, y'all feel this. I, 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 he gave me the, he gave me the, 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 the point. He said, he said, Ed, the problem ain't comprehension. It's, it's probably your clarity. Is, is you, you not saying it like clearly enough. And so, so I, I, I rephrased it, Michael. And I said, I said it a different way. You know, I put this verb on noun on this side and, and participle on this side and did it on this side and I remixed that thing. I was like, maybe I need to say it a different way because it's not that she can't comprehend. It's just I'm not being clear. And imme immediately when I rephrased it, she understood. You know, Paul not only wanted the church to pray for doors of opportunity to be open to him to share the gospel, but that God would grant him clarity. And sharing the gospel well. So look, look, at, the, look at the text with me, we're, and we're done. Look at the text. Verse 3, it says, At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. Verse 4, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. That's the third request and final. We need to pray for the Spirit to give us clarity in sharing the gospel of Jesus with other people. What is the good news of Jesus? Pick your scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Pick your scripture. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, what did Jesus die for? Great question. He died for our sins so that we might be reconciled back to God, so that we would no longer be enemies of God and we can become friends and family of God, so that we can be saved from the wrath of God that is coming on all of evil people and evil world, this evil world. So is Jesus still dead? He, he did die, but that's not how the story is. <laughs> he rose again back to life. So what must do you do you see the I'm trying to I'm trying to simulate being a non-Christian for you. And how do you answer these questions and be clear in our response? So what must I do to be saved then? What must I do to be forgiven of my sins by God? What is my response? Turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. May the Spirit help us to be clear. Not Jesus, y'all, y'all. Uh, let me say it lovingly, but I need to say it how I feel it. S stop, stop adding to Jesus. Stop it. If a non-Christian wants to know how to be saved, stop saying Jesus plus the church, plus giving, plus baptism, plus, plus, plus. No, it's Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus alone. That's it. That's it. How do I become a Christian? Put your faith in Jesus. What do you need to put your faith in Jesus about? That he died for your sins and he was raised from the dead. Is there anything else that I need to do? No. <laughs> That's it. Place your trust 
in Jesus. Throw your weight on Jesus. Put all your hope in Jesus and in his redemptive work. That's it. You mean I ain't got to go to church to be saved? No. You, 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 can, you get saved by placing your faith in Jesus and the church stuff will come. Well, do I need to be baptized and believe to be saved? No, you just need to believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, now that you become a Christian, then you get baptized as a public demonstration or declaration that you believe and belong to Jesus. Just believe in Jesus. Do I got to be good? Do I have to be good and believe? No, just believe in Jesus. Do I, gotta, do I have to change my ways? To be said, no, just believe in Jesus. He will change your ways. And we may, we may not explain the gospel the same way every time. That's not the point. But we need to pray for the Spirit to give us clarity. And people may, may walk away mad. They may walk away sad. They may walk away offended. They may walk away indifferent. But may they at least not walk away confused. Because we failed to be clear. Somebody here today needs to turn and trust Christ. You here, you were invited here, maybe you came with your family, I don't know. We don't know. But we, we, we would be remiss if we didn't do what we have been preaching about. And give somebody in this room possibly, and maybe even somebody online who may be watching this, the opportunity to respond to Jesus. He loves you. He lived the perfect life for you. He came to die on the cross for your sins, and he was raised from the dead. If you would turn from your sin, recognize, you know what? I'm a sinner. Jesus came for me. And you turn and you place your trust in Jesus, that you believe that he lived for you, died for you, for your sins, and was raised from the dead. You can be reconciled to God today. You can become his child. You can be forgiven of all your sins on your way to heaven having new spiritual life in this life today. So we want to appeal to you. Make that, make that choice today. There are others of you here who are Christians, but you are searching for a church home. Maybe somebody invited you, and we are thankful that you're here. And you've been searching, you've been praying, and God sent you our way. God, the Holy Spirit, is impressing upon your heart that this is a church that he wants you to be a part of, you, that you need to learn more about this church, you need to stick with Harvest and learn what it means to be a member of this church and make Harvest your home. We pray that you'll make that decision today. And then there are those of you who are Christian. You may be here and you have never publicly went forward with your faith through water baptism. We want to encourage you to make that step of obedience today. As we say here at Harvest, baptism doesn't make you a Christian, it marks you as one. So we encourage you to make that decision today. So we're about to pray, and as we pray, if you'll take this card, there was a card that you should have received that says, Welcome Home on the back. And whatever decision you're making today, there's four boxes that are listed on that card, three of them related to what we just talked about. Check whatever box or boxes you need to check, and as those boxes come by, if you'll just drop that card in the basket, our Connect team will get with you this week and contact you and talk to you about Jesus and your next steps in relationship to him and his church. And if you need us to pray, family, you know what we're doing today. Um, instead of putting your prayer request on here, you can do that on this card. There's a cross that's out in the foyer with some sticky notes. We're asking you all to take that and put your prayer request on that card and pin that on the cross so that we can be praying uh, this month as we have been doing so far. All right, let's pray. We'll have a couple of announcements and then we'll get out of here. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for people who need to make decisions today. Lord, will you, by your spirit, do that work in their hearts Somebody here needs to come to trust Christ as their Savior and Lord. We pray that you will help them to do that. There are Christians here who need to be baptized. There may be Christians here who need to become a member of this church. Lord, we ask that you will move on their hearts and help them be obedient to you. Pray you will bless us as we worship you in our giving of our tithes and offerings. We love you, Father, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>